Greetings, siblings. Welcome to today's devotion and the end of this week's devotionals. It is Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends out from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your foes. Your people will offer themselves willingly on the day you lead your forces. On the holy mountains, from the womb of the morning, like dew, your youth will come to you. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses, and he will shatter heads over the wide earth. He will drink from the stream by the path. Therefore, he will lift up his head. So this is a rather different psalm, um, at least in my Bible. It's referred to as a royal psalm, which means it is um, a psalm that would have been read or was written uh, in the uh, occurrence of somebody becoming king, being anointed king over the nation of Israel. And it is the establishment by God through human people of this ruler uh, to be a priest and at the same time a king. Um, king's fairly easy to interpret because a king, of course, rules as a king, but the priestly office that is taken uh, over as well by uh, the king of Israel isn't necessarily the king in terms of functioning in the, in the temple, doing sacrifices and whatnot, but a priest being the one who intercedes on behalf of uh, the people. It's a special connection between a priest and God that allows a priest in the temple to do the uh, intercept to, to intercede on people's behalf to pray on their behalf to make sacrifices on their behalf to enter into the holy of holies and make the atonement sacrifice uh, but a king would have been a priest in that manner in terms of interceding uh for people on for to god on behalf of the people being the one that god had called them to called it to lead his people and that would have been uh, you know the implication of that would have been protection and provisions um, and leading them down the right path and all kinds of other things to keep them in covenant with God, to keep them in a good relationship with God. So that kind of is, is the priestly role of how a king would function. But this is a difficult psalm also to translate from the Hebrew. It doesn't really translate very well. And so it's kind of hard to draw out of that what it is that um, this psalm, how this psalm is sort of relevant to us. But uh, the references in this um, psalm, there are several of them that uh, are relevant, at least to the New Testament and to Christ. So uh, the first verse, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool, was a verse that Jesus quoted in a, a confrontation with the Pharisees about who he was, about his identity. Uh, and that has military implications to it. It, it. Sitting at the right hand of God means one who has power and honor. That's a position of power and honor. And of course, Jesus being the Trinity in the Trinity with God is equal to God and sitting at God's right hand, sharing in the glory and power that God has. Uh, and then making enemies a footstool in ancient times. A king would conquer another nation and another king. And they would literally bring them into the throne room and the king would set his feet on the back of a conquered king, sort of like a footstool, kind of an interesting image to think about. But uh, certainly um, Jesus did not act in that manner when he was living on earth, but as God and as king uh, and as um, the high priest, as he's referred to in the book of Hebrews, uh, all of the enemies of God's people will eventually be defeated when he returns again. And that's sort of what the end of this psalm is referring to, that... Um, well, just read the part of that psalm or remember that part of that psalm. He'll shatter the kings on the day of his wrath in verse 5. I'm referring to the day of judgment. The other reference that is relevant to Jesus is verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind that you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek was a figure that came in the pre-Israelite days. Abraham, well, he was Abram at that time, encountered Melchizedek after conquering another nation and he made a tithe in a um, offering to Melchizedek as a high priest, as a high priest for all eternity without beginning or end. And we don't really know much about Melchizedek because Scripture only mentions him a few times in the Old Testament and once in the New Testament. Um, but he is this ancient figure uh, that is hard to interpret or rep but what he represents 
uh, is this figure of eternity. And it becomes slightly more clear in the book of Hebrews when Jesus is referred to as a priest in the order of Melchizedek, one who intercedes for the people uh, on their behalf to God. And there's this um, um, dynamic of him being eternal as well, which of course we know that is true of Jesus. But that's really the interceding part, the priest, that the one that intercedes on our behalf uh, is a function that Jesus does play. I mean, and there's several times in the Gospels where he says, if you pray for things in my name, uh, God will do it for you. And we know that doesn't mean that anything we pray in Jesus' name is going to happen, but according to God's will, Jesus is there is inter interceding on our behalf, not necessarily saying to God, hey, so-and-so is okay, listen to their prayers, they seem to be a good person, a good woman, a good man, whatever. Um, but the intercession that Christ made for us is, is, I think, more in reference to interceding on our behalf for the consequences of our sin. Obviously, dying on the cross took care of all that, and we are no longer... Uh, we are no longer uh, under the threat of having to suffer the consequences and judgment uh, of being people that are corrupted by sin. So Jesus has interceded on our behalf, not just verbally, but giving his own life, spilling his own blood uh, and doing it for our sake so that we can have that relationship, that right relationship with God, just as in the Old Testament days and the temple days when the high priest would make those sacrifices, atoning for the sins of the people, so that then they, again, could be in the right relationship with God, to be connected to God in a way that was personal and that was intimate, that it wasn't distant and didn't include the fear of having to worry about judgment. And so clearly Christ has done that for us as well. And that though this in the sin, this hymn comes in the midst of a bunch of hymns of praise or psalms of praise, to me at least, and this is just my own opinion, makes a lot of sense because for that very reason, for the, the fact that Jesus has interceded on our behalf, against our greatest enemy, and it's, will not, God will never change his mind because of that, that we can give praise and thanks to him and to God for sending his son for our sake. So enjoy the rest of your weekend. Uh, maybe I'll see some of you on Sunday for the drive-in communion. But until then, blessings to you until Monday and Psalm 111.